Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Thursday Spree Seminar. It is a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Boland. Um, John and I met for the first time in uh, November last year at mm -hmm. the Asia Pacific Solar Research Conference mm -hmm. and we got talking about grid integration issues and so forth and I thought it is uh, probably a good idea for him to come here to educate us about these issues. Um, <laughs> because of course it's a very important topic, um, how a large percentage of renewables can be integrated into uh, <coughs> the energy systems. So John is, uh, he refers to himself as a professor of environmental mathematics. I understand he's only one of that kind. Uh, he's also deputy director of the Industrial AI Research Center at the University of South Australia. His research is on environmental mathematics, includes water resource management, renewable energy utilization, energy efficient house design and environmental accounting. Uh, th the reason why he's here today is because his research is also uh, on short-term solar forecasting, particularly in the context of high penetration of solar energy and firm power from renewable energy sources. So without further ado, John, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like first to uh, mention that uh, I come from the land of the Ghana people and I feel very honored that uh, Ghana Elder uh, has given me the designation of uh, Kulta Man or Sleepy Lizard Man. Now, you might think sleepy, okay, right, well, maybe lazy as well. Well, that's good because mathematicians, I reckon, are pretty lazy people. In the sense that we try to figure out the simplest and most efficient way to do things, but we just call it optimization rather than laziness. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about three th issues, approaches to thinking about firm power from my point of view. Obviously there will be others from other people's points of view as well that are important, etc. And also um, you might complain about some of the things I say and that's fine uh, because I might learn uh, something more as well. But in the task 16 from the International Energy Agency that I'm a part of, um, Solar Resource for High Penetration and Large Scale Applications, one of the subtasks um, run by Jan Ramon from Meteonorm in uh, Switzerland and uh, Richard Perez from uh, State University of New York. Uh, probably a lot of people in the solar field have certainly heard of Richard. Um, they've talked about some of the principles behind firm power generation. So the capability for a resource or an ensemble of resources to meet electrical demand all the time, basically, embodying both base load and dispatchable generation capabilities. I'm just quoting from uh, a document from um, this task, subtask. And I think uh, the uh, goal should be to get as close to this as possible. And in fact, even Richard and I have discussed this, it, it's sort of similar with him that, you know, sometimes the last few percent is very difficult. So in this document from the uh, task 16, uh, these are some of the ways that this might be achieved. Through energy storage, absorbing variable renewable energy generation, uh, optimal blending of different uh, sources, of course, which we do quite a bit in Australia, obviously. And uh, that reduces the intermittency of the bundle and uh, you could say reduces the cost of energy storage. Geographic dispersion, that also um, reduces the uh, variability. And also demand flexibility, and, and I'm, I'm afraid that I'll talk later a bit about this sort of concept because um, demand flexibility is usually just moving the demand. I'll talk a bit more about some other things as well. So uh, going further with numbers two and three above, blending and geographic dispersion, both this IEA report and um, some people from UNSW, Alona Ray Costa and Ben Elliston have come to the conclusion that uh, overbuilding is the way to really do it. Uh, now, we've seen, I think, in Australia already that there's some problems with this, some pushback from uh, people about uh, 
not just the installations themselves, but the, the uh, transmission lines and all of that as well. So we have to sort of take that into consideration. But one point in the IEA report is that overbuilding is much cheaper than using battery storage, okay? Now, that's certainly true. May, oh, at the moment, it seems like, from, uh, from the work that they've done. Um, but don't forget, solar panels used to be very expensive and they dropped to very, very low price. Batteries might do the same. So we have to uh, look at that idea. Uh, and maybe mixing might be even a better sort of concept at using optimization techniques. And number four above, about demand. Um, demand, when it's mentioned, only moving it usually is up for discussion, not to actually lowering it. So I'm going to talk about three different topics that have come to my mind that I think are important. And as I said, maybe other, well, I'm sure other people have other things that would be important as well. And uh, also you might um, have some comments about what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so what I'm going to look at first is, okay, how do we actually understand when we might have some problems with dark doldrums, as they're called, or dunkelflauta, or what we would say is the combined VREs being below some threshold which we might have to define. Now this is one of the points. From a mathematician's point of view, all I can do is do some of the analysis setting specific low power output thresholds and see what, how, uh, how probable is it to go underneath those. Uh, policy makers, grid engineers, etc., would have to decide what would that threshold be that would be critical. Okay, but I can do it at many different thresholds and do this analysis, and so that can help inform. And I'm going to use a little toy example. I'm going to use two um, places, uh, Clement Scap Wind Farm from South Australia and Broken Hill Solar Farm in New South Wales, just as a to little toy experiment to show how I work out probabilities in this sort of situation. I've got 30 minute power output and I'm aggreg aggregating it to daily over 12 years and devise a model for it. Uh, there are not 12 contemporaneous years for these two installations, so even at the start I duplicated some data for this little experiment. Right, so the time series model to do this, I'll define the power output of the combined set the output from the solar farm and wind farm together as PT. I find a Fourier series representation of the seasonality of PT, I call it S of T. To find the residual data set R of T, the difference between the two, so removing the seasonality. And then using the Box Jenkins methodology to find a one step ahead forecast model for R of T. Now, if you don't know about Box Jenkins, basically I'm just going to find a so called autoregressive process to model that. Uh, D season data. I'll show you as we go. So this is what the output looks like over two years and I've put the seasonal fit from a Fourier series model, subtract the two of them and then I find a model for the season. It's given here and when I take the difference between the original data and the seasonal component I find a second order autoregressive process for the uh, residual series. Basically just R of T depends on the previous two time steps. Okay? This is a classical sort of uh, autoregressive type process. Now, one of the other ones that you might know, uh, might, might be interesting for you to know about is uh, daily maximum temperature follows probably about a third order autoregressive process. Okay, or daily average temperature as soon as you get rid of the seasonality. And it, it sort of mirrors the physical idea that fronts will come through every three to four days on average. And so the temperature will rise over a few days and then drop, and then rise over a few days and drop. So there is a real physical nature to these sorts of processes. Okay? 
And that's part of the thing that as a so-called statistician mathematician I do. I'll do the statistics or the mathematics and then we try to understand what's driving it. Okay? And if you look at this final model you get that. Now in the classic sort of time series analysis case we hope that it departures from this model, right? The difference between the blues and the oranges, the so-called noise of the series, we hope that we call that ZT. It's always hoped that it's these ZTs over time are independent and identically distributed. And in, if, if it's really perfect, these noise terms would follow a normal distribution. Well, for any system where you have climate variables, not any of those are true, okay? So you have to sort of be a bit tricky and innovative. Just refuting one of these, this is the histogram of the noise. Now it's not that far away from, from symmetric, but, so it's a little bit skewed to the right, but also if you actually looked at it a bit more in depth, it actually would have fatter tails than a normal distribution. Now, what I mean by that is the normal distribution, if you get three de standard deviations away from the mean, okay, then beyond that there's hardly any area, okay? Whereas fat tail means beyond three standard deviations there's still a reasonable amount of area, okay? So we have to take care of that. And also we have the fact that this, these noise terms, when I say in, identically distributed, uh, sorry, independent, where they're not independent is in the variance. The noise terms are so-called heteroscedastic, which means that the noise terms change conditionally over time. In other words, the variance changes over time. That's what heteroscedastic means, okay? So what I'm gonna do first is, how would we set error bounds if it were perfect, okay? If it was IID, and normal and everything. Okay, so I'll show you how you do that first, just to sort of digress for a minute, and then we'll show you how you have to change to our situation. So th I've, this is another little toy thing that I created. This is perfectly uh, created, and um, it's varying over time, but in a very specific sense. And when we fitted the autoregressive model to this, term then the noise terms. Here's basically the distribution of the noise terms with uh, the red curve is a normal curve with the same mean and standard deviation. And you can actually go through and prove statistically that it follows normal distribution, etc, etc. When you do that and you want to put a prediction interval or forecast, a confidence interval around your prediction, your forecast, okay, it's any confidence interval is basically the mean value plus or minus a value from the standard normal distribution times the standard deviation of the, the data, okay? That's just a classic definition of a confidence interval. For a prediction interval, if we forecast one step ahead and then we want to put error bounds around that forecast, you take the forecast value, add and subtract the standard normal value that you want times the standard deviation of the noise. So for instance, if you want a 95% prediction interval, right, you would add 1.96 and subtract 1.96 times the standard deviation from your forecast value, okay? If it was 90%, it'd be 1.645, you know, all of these sorts of things. How do you check if it works? Well, if we want a 95% prediction interval, then 95% of the observed data should fall in that interval. Look what it looks like. By the way, I tested it. Yes, 95% or 95.01% fall within. You know, if I try to 90%, it, it works as well. But one thing to note, if we look at the data is the blue, the orange is the forecast value, so it's forecasting pretty close to the right sort of approach, and these prediction intervals or confidence intervals, the thing to note about them here is that if you look here, if you look at the difference between the upper and lower bound here and the upper and lower bound here, it's exactly the same distance, okay? 
because the variance is not changing over time in this perfect example. Okay? So, how am I going to work out what we do? Uh, that'll be for later, we'll need that. But in this probability sort of thing, what we want to do is we want to find uh, the probability of finding sequences of days in a row below some threshold, which is like a critical value below that, we're going to be in trouble, potentially. Potentially, okay? We not, might not be able to supply the demand, all right? Now, we only have 12 years of data. Uh, often that's not enough to uh, work out things like risk analysis uh, uh, calculations. In fact, um, I had a PhD student funded by AEMO many, many years ago and we worked out uh, risk analysis for um, electricity demand in South Australia. Okay, and uh, basically we took 10 years of demand, half hour demand, we generated uh, uh, 500 years of synthetic demand and then we were able to work out probabilities of exceedance of certain levels of demand and stuff like this. Okay, we're going to do a similar thing here. I'm going to take this data and I'm going to uh, get a large number of years of data. I think I generated 240 years of data to estimate the probability of sequences of days before a prescribed threshold. And this data that we're going to generate is statistically indistinguishable from the 12 years. Okay, it's got the same gross statistics, but it will contain often sequences not seen in the original data. Okay, and I can explain something from the River Murray stuff later on in question time if you're interested to see why this could be important. So we use a concept called bootstrapping. So we had an AR2 model for the autoregressive model. We start at time step three. We've generated two random numbers before that out of the original data. So we generate a random number A from a uniform distribution of 0, 1. This is going to be a probability, okay? And then we find what value in the noise corresponds to that level of probability in the inverse cumulative probability distribution. I'll show you a picture about it in a second. You add this to the forecast from the AR2 model for time step three then add this to the seasonal component, and then you just keep continuing that for as many years as you want. And you generate thousands if you want it, okay? That random noise values, okay, so basically I generated A randomly from a, stand, from a uniform distribution. I've got 0.44, that's our probability, okay, from, and this, Red curve is the cumulative distribution, cumulative distribution function for um, the noise terms, the ZT. I go to 0.44 on the y-axis, rip across to the curve, and then down, and I get a particular value uh, out of that noise term at random. I add that to the forecast value, then add the uh, seasonal value, and I generate that synthetic value at that time step and I just keep doing that for as many years as I want. For the threshold, once again, I think th this is a, a subjective view. You want to figure out what's a lower bound on what amount of energy might need to generate. I've taken the tenth percentile of the data. What you do is in terms of um, what a person might do in general is you might take 5%, 10%, 20%, see how much they differ and stuff like this, and then you can give that to the decision makers and they can make their decision what's a, a good threshold, what's the lowest output we can uh, tolerate, shall we say, and go from there. And then when I did that, I wrote some code to work out, okay, in my synthetic years, what are the chances of getting two days in a row below the threshold, three days, four days, five days, six days, and seven days in a row below the threshold? And 
the threshold was 18 megawatts. And as I said, I calculated the probability of occurrence of these sequences. And I looked at what time of year they might occur as well, which co of course could be important because of course, in certain times of the year, there's not much load, there's not much demand, so it might not matter if we have very low supply, okay? You know, in the shoulder times, like November, like uh, April, might not matter if we're really low in, in supply. Uh, what I found was that two days in a row in my thousand years, oh yeah, I generated a thousand years here, we had five yearly of two days in a row, I could generate 10,000 if you want, but <laughs> uh, three days in a row, one and a half year uh, of occurrences yearly, up to seven days in a row, it took 40 years to get a return, okay? And that can help decision makers make an, uh, understand what sort of probability of occurrence you, you might have and whether that's a problem or not. Okay, so that's, that's the one thing I wanted to show, that this is how maybe mathematicians, statisticians can help in this area, one, one place. Okay, forecasting. Why do we need it? Well, I'm going to talk about, this little example is from demand, but just think of it as well in forecasting, if you think about it, if you've got storage systems and stuff like this, one of the things you're going to want to do is figure out, okay, what, what do I expect from my VREs in the next five minutes, half an hour, day, whatever? Will I send my output to batteries or Snowy 2 if it ever exists? Or um, will I uh, send it directly to uh, supply demand, blah, blah, blah? You've got to make these decisions. So you need to f do some forecasting of what you expect. But interestingly, I, I, I thought I'd look at, I wanted to look at um, some idea about demand as well, because I had a little bit of a thought with a former PhD student of mine who uh, needed to look at demand in South Australia. So this is demand in South Australia and ramp rate. So the difference between the um, demand at one five minute interval minus the five minute interval before, okay? And then what I did, well, this is, I took the absolute values of all these demands and then aggregated them over a day and looked at the mean yearly uh, daily average, uh, mean yearly average over a number of years. And something weird seems to be happening. If you look at this graph, down here in up to 2017, it's very low. All of a sudden there's a big jump and I'm going to have to investigate a bit more about exactly why this is happening. But uh, my former student is finding a similar thing. I'm not sure if he's finding exactly this sort of quantum leap, but he's certainly finding an increase in the, in the aggregated ramp rate over time. Uh, and the other thing I thought about in here is that it seems to dip down in here and uh, I'd have to investigate further. Yes, Alistair? John, sorry, silly question if I'm... Good. Um, Units for the round rate. It just is that to just total. Oh yeah, um, megawatts. Megawatts. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like megawatts over a five-minute interval. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. No, but aggregated. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't bother averaging or anything. I just I wanted to show the picture more than anything okay. and see the difference over time. Okay. So yeah, I could I could, you know, okay. normalize it and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. The other thing in here, I thought, well, I wonder if that's got anything to do, uh, what do we have in 2019 to 2021? Climate phenomenon. La Nina. Maybe there's something to do with that. I don't know. I'm, I haven't looked at it enough. But anyway, things are happening over time. And maybe things are happening over time as well in uh, supply as well, we, in terms of ramp rate. We'll have to look at it. So anyway, I already said stuff about this, that um, you got some forecasting method, you've got uh, seasonality, you've got some autoregressive part of it. In some cases you've got exogenous variables, certainly when you're looking at demand you have things like temperature and in places like here probably humidity as well. Not in South Australia because we don't have any humidity in South Australia so we just, we outlawed it I think. And, and then you have uh, the ZTs, okay? So when we're looking probabilistic forecasting, okay, 
we're going to have to think about something different from just, you know, those assumptions about IID, etc. So I'm going to look at two methods. Uh, I'll have to do them fairly quickly because, um, but just to show you that it can be done. One is called quantile regression applied to the noise terms, and the other involves a, a thing that actually goes to the fact that it's not normal. You can normalize, you can do a normalizing transformation, do predictions of variance, set error bounds, and then back transform and stuff like this. It's it's pretty complicated, but mathematicians like complicated things. So. But before we do the quantile regression, I want to just make sure everybody knows how ordinary linear regression goes. Now I know you can just take a set of points, you can shove them into a machine and get the line of best fit. But mathematically, you need to know how to do it before you can understand quantile regression. Okay? So basically, this is just an example from my second year engineering modeling class that I did with a, a simple linear regression. You get the line of best fit, but how do you get the slope and, and intercept? Well, here's a, another little picture where we've got the line of best fit, we've got some dots. We've got the difference between the y values and the line for the same x value, okay? So you've got a bunch of EIs for each point, okay? What you do is you square them all, add them together, and you find the best B0 and B1, slope and, uh, intercept and slope, to find the line of best fit. The best means it minimizes the sum of those squared errors, okay? Now, to actually do it, you can use first year calculus, partial derivatives with respect to B0 and B1, but we won't go through that. But the point is that what we're doing is we're operating a little optimization problem on those squared differences, those squared errors, okay? So that's what you do in simple linear regression. When we move to quantile regression, you've got a similar style of things. You might have multiple you might have a B0 and multiple B1, B2, B3, or betas, okay? And you've got, a, uh, once again, a difference between the actual values of the Ys and, excuse me, and the model, but at different quantile levels. So in other words, if you want to set a 95% prediction interval, instead of doing that thing I did before with the simple normal one, when we have changing variance and when we have changing distributions and everything like this, what you do is you'll take the two and a half percentile or quantile and the 95, seven and a half quantile and you put those as the upper and lower bounds, okay? If you want a 90%, you take the 5% and 95% and you use those as the bounds. So you don't have to go through this mathematical thing here, just know that that is possible, and once again it's a simple op optimization pro uh, problem. You might have to use some uh, search techniques or whatever, uh, but you can do it quite simply. And so the other one is more complicated, and I'll just sort of pass over a little bit just to show you that, you know, this is possible. Once again, you've got noise terms, the Zs, you transfer them to the, set, the equivalent value in a standard normal distribution, okay? You use uh, methods originally designed in financial time series. I don't know if anybody's heard of Arch and Garch models. You can use those. We're not going into them, don't worry. <laughs> and you can forecast the variance, set your error bounds, back transform, okay? And that's how you do it that way. The way you do it there, You've got some noise term. We're going the opposite way I did before. You've got a noise term, you go up to the curve. Now, interestingly enough, this is the cumulative distribution functions of the noise terms. And you can see it's highly steeped in the center, okay? Now, one of the interesting things is for any wind solar farm output, anything like that, or even solar energy itself, the noise terms will always have this wild sort of uh, cumulative distribution is reflecting the idea that it's highly peaked in the center and fat tails. 
okay? And so we go up there, go across here, we get a probability, you know, 0.09 or something like this. Go to the standard normal cumulative distribution function, take that same value, go across, and we get a corresponding value from the standard normal distribution. Then we can play with that with Arch and Garch models to forecast the variance and then go backwards. It's complicated, but it's doable. So this just goes through the, the way you would do it. This is, once again, 95% prediction interval. Use 1.96 as the magic number. And what, this is what it looks like. So these are prediction intervals. for This is just Broken Hill Solar Farm. This is on a five-minute basis. And basically, it's interesting because the data is in the dark blue. The one step ahead forecast is in the orange. I'm not, I still can't figure out why it's going down in this afternoon. Um, I've been trying to figure that out for a while. You'll notice that, of course, the output is capped, okay, because the field is overbuilt, okay, as with quite a few solar farms in Australia. The, from the quantile regression, the gray is the lower bound and the yellow is the upper bound. From the transformation uh, method, the light blue is the lower bound and the green is the upper bound. Now the interesting thing is that uh, if you see here on cl clear days, the transformation method seems to work better. On cloudy days, the quantile method seems to work better. And so one might imagine that if you could mix those two in a proper way using things like machine learning techniques, you can probably do a lot better than just that. I mean, I tried a very simple thing just to see if it would work. I just tried averaging the two, but that didn't help a hell of a lot. But I'm sure we can uh, get better than just that. Okay. Now, the third topic I want to talk about is something that when we're talking about Renewable energy supply, we often don't talk about demand. And I figure that we have a lot of needless demand in Australia. Okay? And one of the main areas is in housing. It's been said that Australians basically live in expensive tents. Okay? And sometimes super expensive tents. All right? An article in the ABC Online on 26 January had these hints on how to beat the heat while saving money. Avoid too low sense set points for aircon. You don't need a set point of 20 degrees when it's 37, okay? Have you ever heard of Fanger? Alistair has. The, what was it, 11 degrees below the ambient? Something of that as the maximum difference. Probably, because it was in Northern Europe, probably that can be relaxed a bit you know, you, you don't want it when it's 45 in Adelaide, you don't want it at 34 inside. But, you know, you still, ha you know, you might want it still at 28 and it's still quite a big difference and, and good enough. Uh, added to that, there was a University of Sydney report last year, which I thought was really, really interesting, that if you want the effect of an 24% uh, 24 degree set point, Use fans in a 27 degree set point and you'll save a lot of money and energy, okay? And in fact, I noticed that last night where I'm staying up on Belmore Road. I uh, had the window all open everything like this, but there wasn't much breeze last night. So, you know, in the middle of the night I woke up and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to turn the air con on for a little bit. So I closed everything up, turned the air con on. If I'd had a fan, I wouldn't have to do that, okay? Closed gaps and crap, insulated possible. I can't believe that some people still ignore insulating the ceilings when, they're, when they've got the ability to do it. Open the house for ventilation when cool and close when hot, obviously. I would look ahead a few days and plan your actions. Use plants for shading. Um, I'll go further and say for general climate control, because it actually cut hot winds in summer and cold winds in winter. Uh, we do that and stuff like that. Awnings. Uh, now, a lot of people install roller blinds. Uh, you still, if you get the heat inside, they're still going to, it's still going to be trapped in there. Whereas if shading, it'll keep that solar radiation off. And that's, that's not in the article. I just added that. But this list frightens me. 
Not the list itself, it's very good advice. What frightens me is these things that you have to actually mention them at all. You shouldn't have to mention them, they should be obvious. You need minimum glazing on the west side, shaded when existing. These are extra things that weren't... Ah, oh, yeah, no black roofs. Yes, the, the old uh, fur fee. It's actually been outlawed in northern Adelaide uh, just recently. Why not the whole of Adelaide? I don't know. Anyway, precinct design, well, not just block design. Um, the standard thing in Europe uh, for centuries, if you got a whole big block, you might sort of have all around the perimeter, three, say three-story apartment building in the center green space. Okay. In Victoria, they mandate permeable surface minimums. Okay. For flood control. And we'll talk about some other things. So this is a new house in my street. Guess which way it's facing? West. With all that glass, yes. And just a driveway, and I hate calling this artificial lawn, or t grass, because it's got nothing to do with grass. So of course, you, all of this will heat up in the, in the uh, hot summer afternoon, and especially in Adelaide, where you know it's boiling hot anyway, often. And uh, they won't, they'll just have to turn their aircon on full blast for so long. And of course it matters because this is actually something I've looked at, the number of days per decade over 40 degrees in Adelaide, okay? And each time, like 1940, this is the decade starting in 1940. So look how, what was it in the 2010s? 69 days, okay? Over 40. But because it's dry heat, you can deal with it. This is the back of our house facing west. Vegetation, gee, shading the house. And some, you can see uh, a little bit here, there's some awnings as well to help. And this is the front of our house with our air conditioners. They're called trees. So we use fans and trees and that's it. We don't have mechanical air conditioning in a place with 69 days over 40 in a decade. But, you know, we uh, do well. Oh, by the way, we're actually, with a bit of money, we're monitoring the effects of the garden as well. And uh, we've got monitors that all around the garden, in the house, in a shed, and also in an open area across the street for comparison purposes. We're doing that over a year. Because one of my former PhD students found that also in, not the interesting thing is that obviously that should help in summertime for the heat, but at nighttime in winter, it's warmer than if it's totally bare as well. So it'll help at nighttime in winter too. So from my point of view, overbuilding, I think certainly will benefit firm power. But what has happened, especially um, some of the great examples recently, from just from wind farms and solar farms, if you get the community on board, you're going to be, it's going to be very easy compared to not. Okay. The increasing demand wrap rate may mean that batteries are part of the mix. So once again, use optimization to see how much of each you might need, rather than just say, I'll go for this or I'll go for that. Okay. Community batteries, uh, we did some uh, research uh, a few years ago with uh, data from Lockheel Park, Green Village in Adelaide, where it really looked like the community batteries were much better mixed than just uh, everybody getting their own. I've got my own, but you know, it's, not, it's because there's no community batteries avail uh, you know, in my area at the moment. We can't just think of supply alone, and we should try to lower it rather than just shift it. Okay. So that's why I was talking about that. And of course, EV charging adds to the complexity. And why I say that is that, you know, it's quite easy to say to somebody, okay, it's best to charge your EVs when there's solar available in the solar sponge times of the day and stuff like this. But if you look back at this house, it doesn't mean that these people are stupid or anything. They just have no knowledge of how you should design the building. Will they also be able to say, oh, I should only charge my EV in the middle of the day? No, they might just come home and say, well, I want to charge it tonight. 
and add to the whole problem, okay? Uh, so you've got to think of some other ways of dealing with that. Maybe huge tariffs at nighttime for, for battery charging or something like that, you know? So, and you often have to impose these things. Um, I work a lot in energy efficient housing, as I was saying before, and I've always had the, the notion that the six star rating, or now seven star rating, is insufficient. What you should do first is mandate certain things, certain levels of insulation, uh, ins uh, insulation and perhaps certain levels of glazing, and then do the energy rating after that. Okay? So, Otherwise, people will find, and they do, find ways around it. And, the, you know, because people are, by nature, um, optimizers in a way, optimizing their business plan rather than anything else. Now, if you want to look at um, some more about our garden and how it works and stuff like this, you can go to... Mediterranean Mindset, Gardening Australia, and see a good thing. And we were on the new Adela Channel 9 News recently as well. And you can have a look at a uh, report on the increasing number of extreme hot days in Adelaide. And some references. Um, my PhD student, Mina, is about optimizing tree arrangement policy in residential settings. Because, um, you know, if you look at Mediterranean mindset, we'll see, you'll see that my wife and I live in a jungle. Not everybody's going to take care of a jungle. It's a lot of work. But Mina worked out ways that you can put around a house a minimum number of trees of the right type, right positions, heights, etc., to have a good effect. Not as good as ours, but still a good effect. There's stuff about probabilistic forecasting, wind and solar. Oh, the one thing I didn't mention, if we're designing a house now, it's no good making a seven-star house for today's conditions. It's not, hopefully not going to fall down in 30 years. So you want to have it designed for those conditions, not now. And if anybody's interested, I'm hosting the International Enviro-Metric Society Conference in December in Adelaide. And... I finished one minute early. <laughs> so questions. Now, uh, Rob's going to run around uh, with a microphone. I know you're loud, Alistair, but still. It's got to be available to other people, not just. Ah, oh, Thanks very much, John. Thanks for that talk. John, some absolutely 100% uh, agree with you, I think, on most points. So you haven't upset me too much. Ah. Yeah. I haven't done my job. There's a few little arm wrestles there, but... Um, yeah, sure. But, uh, yeah, look, I think one of the interesting things is for pushing for better housing. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm all for doing as much as we can on the passive side. You run into the issue of the building costs in Australia. As soon as you engage with the building industry, just the costs now seem to be ridiculous. So to put some shading on my place, I, I forked out you know, thousands and thousands of yeah. dollars. Uh, and it would have been much better off if it had been built, shaded in the first place. But anyway, my, my contention too, on, on your list I would add PV panels on the roof, yep. plus, plus a reverse cycle air conditioner mm -hmm. in a seven star house, I reckon is pretty optimal. Yep. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure we need to push towards anything more than a seven star dwelling, only because the PV in the reverse cycle will handle, you can pre-cool, you can preheat your house. I, I think that's a good solution, but yeah. Anyway, interested to have that conversation. I think uh, that's good. And once again, it's, it's back to that idea of trying to figure out how you optimize the situation. So not necessarily prescribing exactly what you do, but working out what's the best uh, fit and often as you say one of the things is the retrofitting side of it and how you do that properly um, and which is the best thing for a retrofitting exercise okay like with our house we retrofitted it was a 40s weatherboard house but it was easy to retrofit because it, it was weatherboard and so when we took the asbestos cladding off the outside we filled the walls with insulation before we put the new cladding on 
We had some termite damage, so we uh, also insulated the interior walls when we fixed that up. So we could zone the house and all this sort of stuff. So it just depends on the situation. Uh, with retrofitting, one of the things that's quite fascinating, we, we have a new project starting uh, right at the moment where we're going to uh, test retrofitting uh, um, indigenous housing in the APY lands in northern South Australia. And that should also give us some interesting things too, because you've got to look at also at things like cultural norms and uh, things like that as well and the usage, how you, the houses, houses are used, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you're quite right, but I guess one of the things you can say is that Australia's way behind in ret retrofitting. I mean, Portugal started retrofitting uh, apartment blocks in the 1990s to uh, be of higher energy standard, okay? And so uh, it can be done, but it, it's, not, it's a big job. But you see, even with that house that I showed, like that's a brand new house and it's not properly done. Okay? So we, are, we have an ongoing problem. Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, thanks, John, for your wonderful talk. Um, you, you said that you're using 12 years worth of data and then yeah. you use all your statistical models yeah, and magic, magic, magic to uh, create uh, 10,000 years worth yeah, of data. Whatever you wanted, yeah. Now, in recent years, we had several 100-year events yep. in terms of flooding, for example. Yep, exactly. And uh, my question is, if it happens to be that in these 12 years of data, there is none of those, yep. how, how are you able to predict those, uh, okay, so those outliers? So what, what can happen, what happens is that this sort of, um, micro statistics and macro statistics in a time series okay so you can fill up the macro statistics and make them exactly the same stats okay but you might have or you will have almost certainly sequences that didn't appear in the um, historical record now as an example remember I mentioned the Murray River okay so I used to many years ago work for the Murray River Commission before it was the Murley Darling Commission. So, in fact, I was their, their um, mathematician and computer scientist all rolled into one when it was a much smaller organization. And they, when they want to work out how to run the river, because the river is run, it's not just a free flowing river by any means, there's lots of dams and everything like this, and you've got to decide where you want the water at different times of the year and blah, 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 and it takes a long time to get from one end to the other. When they decide on management policies, they use historical data. And they thought that they had enough historical data because they had over 120 years of, of uh, stream flows, rainfall, all that sort of stuff. Not anywhere in that data set was the drought that we had in the early 2000s of four years in a row of drought. Whereas if they had used these sort of bootstrapping methods, they could generate 10,000 years, wherein there would be, hopefully, some period where there was four years in a row of drought. And even if there wasn't, you could, if there were three years, you could maybe just pluck another year and put it in just to test extreme situations. So, you know, you, you've that, got, but... Is that, is that what you've done? Then? Yes. Because that's still something I'm wondering. Like yeah, that's what I did. How, how can you generate data that have these? Well, you, you don't necessarily generate that have it. You hope that they have it. And especially if you generate enough years, you hope that there will be sequences because of those autoregressive parts. Because they, they will return to the mean, but sometimes they'll take a lot longer to return to the mean than in other times. Okay? And so hopefully you'll get some of these extreme sequences. Okay? And especially if you generate more and more and more years, you hope that uh, it'll cover it. And if it doesn't, if there's one particular set that you're really concerned about, you can grab something that's close to it and then try and you know, rig the, the, the remaining part if you really need to. Yeah. So over there. Hi, uh, um, 
Paolo, um, a master student here at Renewable Energy Engineering. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you're able to reconcile your probabilistic forecasting with the climate models that are uh, released by the IPCC. Like there, are, there are climate models that uh, project, for example, extreme temperatures on a high emission scenario or a low emission scenario. Mm -hmm. Like, is that does your modeling uh, fit in with that? Well, what I was doing is basically very short term stuff. Okay. Uh, to fit in with those, you'd have to make some alterations to the historical data that you've got, possibly, to fit in with those. That's why I was saying, for instance, that's the sort of thing that we did in this third paper down here, okay? Integrating climate change into uh, weather data for building energy simulation. We sort of looked at those sorts of forecasts of what, um, not just of means and stuff like this, but also of changes in distribution of the weather variables or climate variables and then put it into those weather data sets. So that's how you sort of help integrate it, I think. I think Alistair's got a supplementary question. Yes, sorry. Or a different one maybe even? Different one. John, you're intrigued to see your thinking or to hear your thoughts on EVs. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about EVs, if we keep them being moderately efficient or reasonably efficient, they probably chew six to eight kilowatt hours a day to travel 20,000 right. kilometres a year. Yeah. If we look at uh, the distribution of uh, electric hot water heaters, which are currently being thrown from out of the middle of the night to being heated in the middle of the day to soak up lots of solar that we yeah, seem to yeah. have a lot of. Um, converting, in, giving people the incentive to switch from electric resistance hot water heaters to heat pumps would probably save seven or eight kilowatt hours a day, yeah. which rather than going into resistively heating your hot water could be charging your electric vehicle somewhere in the network. Sure. Um, yeah, just, I, I don't think EVs are such a big problem if we, if we phase out, um, you know, inefficient use of electricity. We're still... No, uh, pr quite possibly, yes. Once again, you know, uh, going back to the retrofitting and stuff like that, if you're using stuff all for heating and cooling in the evening, um, maybe you can use it for EVs. Yeah. I, I so. think hot water is and, and hot water, yeah. Hot water and pool pumps are probably going to be, well, maybe yeah. in Adelaide in the summer it's a big load on air conditioning is free. Yeah. yeah, I think there's lots of energy inefficiency that we could... Of course. Still, yeah, it seems to be... But it's not sexy, is it? That's the thing. You're, you're not building things. <laughs> yeah, make it sexy somehow, yes. Yeah, so. No, the idea of Alistair Sproul in a bikini, no. <laughs> Thorsten. Oh. oh, not Shukla. <laughs> uh, so my question is like, completely based on the probabilistic modeling so yeah. like we are always interested in understanding the sequence of one and like having a probability of one in one like back to back sort of events so like if we had an extreme event in 2020 we are interested if it's going to be follow on following on 2021 then 2022 or not so adjust somehow so can we identify the patterns of those sequences using a simplified approach that doesn't involve like a lot of machine learning or including 10 variables to understand if that sequence is happening? Uh, on that time scale, probably not, I don't think. I think you need, because I mean, the stuff I do is very, very short term stuff because it's all geared towards the, the market and stuff like that. When you go to longer time scales, you have to use much different methods. Yeah, you briefly mentioned uh, that overbuilding is potentially a more cost-effective solution uh, yeah. for firming than yeah. battery storage, for example. Yeah, so at I was the moment, just, at least. Yeah. I was just wondering whether you have a high-level summary of what the firm energy system of the future, I say 98% renewable energy system with firm power, would look like in Australia in terms of the percentages of wind, solar. Yeah, I think the, one of the best ways for the Australian... Uh, application of it because in that International Energy Agency one there's some applications from uh, Switzerland, United States, well there's the two leaders are 
from those places, and I think one other place as well. Uh, but if you go back to, I mentioned Alona Ray Costa and uh, Ben Elliston from UNSW, their paper on it from 2023, I think it is, that's probably a good place to start because they go into that uh, quite specifically about a, the Australian situation. Okay, So that would be a good, good place to have a look. Um, I think there's one back at the back, Dan. Hey John, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts on, obviously these dark doldrum events yep. will be able to be forecast maybe like seven days in advance of them hitting the grid. Um, do you have any thoughts on potentially what governments could do to, you know, say there might be this dark doldrum coming, uh, maybe everyone charge up your EVs, you know, before it hits, or are there any other strategies like that you can think well, of? Well, I think a lot of those sort of things, and uh, it's probably a bit long term, but uh, Alistair was mentioning something else as well, that if you have, well, sorry, one thing, if you if you have the right sort of home situation, you can, if you, maybe not for that long a stretch, but certainly you can use pre-cooling and pre-heating methods as well. Uh, we did a pre-heat cooling test example for the RACE CRC, and we found that, of course, as obvious, for most of the houses in Australia, it was of no use at all to pre-cool in the afternoon, because if you have a, an average um, energy star rating of, what is it, about 1.8 or something like this, it's not going to help at all, because as soon as you cool it, the heat's going to just come through the walls and destroy everything anyway. But I think, I think there's a lot of things if you look ahead, as you were sort of saying, and think, okay, what's coming? And that's not just on the, the seven day event or anything like this, but even one or two days, you can do a hell of a lot to help yourself. Um, and what we do, for instance, you know, at nighttime, and it depends on where you live, and et cetera, et cetera. Where we live in Adelaide, we get afternoon and evening breezes uh, in summertime. And so we'll throw the, all, the, all the windows and doors open and stuff like this at nighttime to uh, cool the house if we know it's going to be hot next day and the day after, right? And you know, do that sort of thing. And at the same time, you'll go up and down the street and you'll find all the houses are totally closed up with the aircon on. And it's nice and cool outside. But, you know, so I think, well, governments, I'm not sure exactly what. You give government um, advice. We give government advice about bushfires and stuff like this. Maybe that sort of thing could be helpful as well. There was a talk about... Uh, um, you know, not just heat wave advice, but extreme heat wave advice and stuff like this as well. So, you know, maybe that's where you could intervene. All right, well, it's one o'clock. Unless there's any other urgent questions, I'd say we thank John again for his beautiful presentation. Thank you.